right, we're recording so you can start as soon as you're ready. Okay, Sandy's not with us yet and neither are any of the other presenters. <laughs> I see that, oh, I see they're all in the wings. Yep. Chris, Chris Davis, Stephanie, I, I'll bump them in now. Oh, I can bring them in. But I also want to wait for Sandy to to start. Maybe I'll just do the, we have one minute. Am I right? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, Sandy has just joined us. Terrific. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the Thursday, March 28th meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And seeing that we have a quorum, my, the first thing I'll do is make sure the members of the committee can hear and be heard. And then, um, you know, I'll turn to Sandy on what, what order we want to take, whether we want to deal with this five year summary. I see the presenters are all here, so maybe start with the projects first. Okay, so I'm just going to call out names in the order I see them on my screen and just indicate if you can hear and we'll hear you. Bob Hegner, Jean, Eugene Gofredo, here, Lee Edwards, here, Sarah Marshall, here. Um, and Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. And uh, Jennifer Xiao, who is not on the screen, emailed to say she would not be attending today. And I think Bob is today, you're taking minutes? Yes, I've got minutes. Yes. Okay, so we have an assigned minute taker, a, a willing volunteer. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll start with... Um, Dave, Chris, and Stephanie, you should say which which order you want to go with. You're you're listed as a group of planning, conservation, and sustainability, which that all kind of goes together. Why um, don't we, if if it's okay with you, Kathy, why don't we start with um planning? Okay. That's okay with Chris. There we go. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director. Um, are we talking about um, FY25 or are we talking about other years? We're we're focused on FY25. Um, and okay. if you want to give us a hint about the future years, but just um, so far, what we've been looking at is a budget. There are more requests than the amount of money we have to do. But, um, but yes, we're focused on the coming fiscal year. Okay, um, so I have three requests, and um, I think I'll talk about the one that uh, is really top of mind to me, um, which is the Civil War tablets. So there was a group in town that um, worked very hard to um, bring the Civil War tablets out of storage and get them renovated, and they've been on display in the bank center, and there's a plan to um, <clears throat> have a place for them in the library, in the new library. Um, however, the library budget doesn't contain anything for um, designing a, a place to display them or to um, have some sort of interpretive signage or, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, make the walls sturdy enough to hang them if that's the method that we choose to display them. So there's a space that's been designated, but no no accoutrement, if you will, to support them. So um, <clears throat> we applied for, um, I think it was, let's see, 50,000. It's This has been back and forth. So I think I applied for $50,000 in FY25. And since then, I've had conversations with Dave Zomek and others to say that it's really more like um, $150,000 that we need to do this whole thing. I'm not sure what your paperwork says, but um, anyway, we could split it up 50, 
$1,000 one year, $100,000 another year. But in any event, what it's for is really just um, hiring a designer, probably an architect, to design a space for these, figure out how many and which ones should be displayed, and then designing the, the display mechanism. Are they going to be mounted on the wall or supported in some other way? Um, uh, interpretive signage, lighting, and then, you know, whatever kind of special mechanisms need to be uh, put there to um, preserve these these uh, these monuments um, into the future. So that's what that money is about. And there may be need for climate control. I'm not really sure because I'm not an expert in this type of thing. But um, I think we had, let's see, design engineering fees, 50000 And then we had construction, 100000 Um so that's that's my presentation on that one. Do you want me to keep going, or would you like to ask me questions about this this request? Um, but do people have questions? You know, I wasn't actually sure it was on the list for this year or not on, in terms of the list. But um, I have a couple questions. Um, one is just I'm surprised it wasn't in the library budget because I thought it was uh, in part the basis that they got the big NEH grant. Um, because of the cultural center. So Leah's shaking her head. So although it was featured as the cultural side, there was never any money put in to the budget for this. That's what I'm hearing, correct? That's what I understand, yep. And and then the installation, the 100,000 is when the, the library is physically open is when you would be putting everything else in, correct? You know, so the 50 is to design it, and then the 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 100 is the estimate on what you said, uh, display it, figure out how it's going to be displayed, whether there's lighting, whether there's walls. That's what... Well, the design is... That. The design would be for the architect and a structural engineer to look at the room where this is going to be proposed to be. Maybe they could do that by looking at the drawings and then plan ahead for what is needed for that space in order to support the display of these um, monuments. And more than that, I don't really know. And I don't know if it's going to be limited to $100,000. Um, this was an estimate that we are putting forth to you, but it could be more than that. So um, I don't know if Dave has any um, anything to add to this, but that's kind of what I know about this. Okay, so it. I think you were very careful in your wording. So it isn't necessarily including the cost of installing it. Is that correct? I think the hundred thousand would include the cost of installing it. We're hoping we can get it designed for fifty thousand, and okay. then a hundred thousand to build whatever needs to be built, structural or whatever, um, for a hundred thousand. But as I said, we don't actually have an estimate from a contractor to do that. So that's just a you know, an estimate that we think might work. Okay, so I see Sarah has her hand up and Lee. Sarah, and then Lee. Yeah, I, I can see that um, the design work could be done in fiscal in FY25, but I'd, I'd be surprised if you need the money for constructing the whatever it is in the next fiscal year. So perhaps that part could be delayed. And Lee. Okay, my understanding, which is imperfect, and I will go back and I will talk with Sharon to see if I can get a more perfect understanding, or maybe uh, Mr. Zomack could enlighten me. My understanding, well, first of all, I, I know for sure that the Civil War tablets sort of came in after the building project was well underway. Um, I, I believe that the town owns, that I, I'm quite certain that the library does not own the Civil War tablets. That's um, right. Okay, and I think there may be some joint grant activity going on in relationship to getting some federal support through maybe the park service as a historical artifact. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure what the status of that is at the moment, but um, I, you know, I think um, uh, yeah. <laughs> accommodating the Civil War tablets was not part of the um, the, the process for which the library has assembled all of the various pieces of funding that have gone into the project so far. It's a, it's a kind of addition, and we're all trying to figure out ways to accommodate this wonderful resource that is part of the town's history. Dave, and then Sarah, I see your hand. Is, is that up again? No. Okay, Dave. I'm sure. Thanks, Kathy. So yeah, I think all of the things that folks have have contributed are are generally accurate. I would say, you know, there is not a perfect plan yet put together on on how to bring to fruition putting the the Civil War tablets in the in the Jones. I will say, you know, we we've been having conversations with the the team at the Jones, Sharon and the team and the architects for a couple of years now, and the the library graciously. Uh, designed the building with square footage available in a location that we think we collectively um, think is an appropriate spot for the Civil War tablets. Uh, as Chris indicated, um, we are trying to seed the project, and I think there will be, as indicated, there will be some grants that are being pulled together now. Uh, some of them may have already gone out the door. Um, by um, supporters of the Civil War tablets um, and their their um, their the work that's already been done uh, to show them in the bank center. So I think there's going to be private funding. Uh, we're seeking capital funding. In all likelihood, we would uh, go to CPA and pull this all together. The timing is a little bit unclear at this point. So I think Sarah's point is well taken, which is we're really in the design phase right now of what would the room need? What would the room need structurally? These these tablets weigh anywhere between 500 and 700, 750 pounds each. Um, there's a number of them. How would, be, how would they be displayed? What are the structural improvements that need to be done to that room and those walls to to display them? So I think that's kind of where, where we are right now. Um, and again, we're very uh, grateful to the Jones for including them in their design. We think it's a great, um, a great space and uh, a permanent place. The town does own the tablets, and uh, we'll have them on display, if you will, at the Jones, hopefully in perpetuity. So that's what we know. Thank you. Okay, Chris. Is did Chris disappear? <laughs> She said she had three, and we overwhelmed her with the first one. <laughs> Let me just see. She's, what... in the, she's in the attendees list. But... She's in attendees. Uh, I don't see her in attendees. It was. I see Jennifer. I see, you see Jennifer and Ray. She was there. Okay. Um, she's probably having trouble. Okay, well... so why don't we go... For the sake of time, Kathy, I can yeah. jump in on one... FY25 request, okay. because I note that um, if I'm not mistaken, I might be looking at an older version, but the demolition of the former clubhouse at Hickory Ridge yep. appears to be um, in two places. Yeah. And maybe you've already dealt with that in your budget, but clearly we do not need $300,000 for the demolition of the uh, former clubhouse at Hickory. So while Chris is rejoining us, maybe I could speak to that. Okay. And um I think it appears under conservation and uh, and planning. Hopefully, I just saved uh, us one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. But uh, anyway, we are looking for funding to demolish and remove and regrade the site at the former Hickory Ridge Golf Course. Um, there is about a sixty-five-year-old clubhouse there. Perhaps many of you have passed by it on your way on West Pomeroy Lane. Um, that project is moving along quite well. I'm supposed to give the council, I'm scheduled to give the council an update on it on uh, April 8th. Um, we are moving forward with the solar project on site. Um, that is getting uh, back underway as we speak uh, after some delays in permitting um, uh, at the state level, not at the local level for the most part. Um, and then uh, we are also getting um, going on 
um, and making it fully accessible to those people who live around the course and north of the course as per the uh, the plans for, for Hickory Ridge. With that said, we have this very old kind of derelict building in the middle of our project, which we estimate will cost about $150,000 to fully remove, regrade the site for future uses. It is becoming, it is not only an eyesore, but it is now becoming um, um, clearly, you know, um, a concern, I will say, uh, from a, a danger standpoint that it does not become, um, you know, a, a nuisance and, a, and, a, and a, a dangerous spot for young people or others visiting the site. So we're getting ready to invite people there to utilize some of the trails. And we've boarded up the building, as you've probably seen when you've gone by, um, but um, the, the building needs to come down. Uh, I've worked with the building commissioner, with the fire chief, and they are both in agreement that there is no salvaging the building, reusing the building. It should come down. It also makes way for uh, possible reuse of the site. Uh, we've talked about possible reuses there. We're exploring things like affordable housing. We're exploring that site for a future um, uh, fire station as well and some other potential uses. So that in a nutshell is the request. Um, we have um, estimates based on other buildings that we're bringing down. Um, we are we are uh, demolishing the former VFW building right down the street from Town Hall, and we already have quotes on that. So that's where the uh, $150,000 estimate came from. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Um, okay. Sarah, Sarah Kathy, has her. Take Kathy, her Christine is in the attendees. Okay, I'll put her back in. So, Dave, this, this might not save any money, but I know that fire departments sometimes like to, I don't know, you know, use abandoned buildings for training, you know, I don't know, set them on fire and then put them out <laughs> or chop holes yeah. or whatever. So is that, our, is that well, something you're considering? It's a great question. So our fire department has been chopping a lot of holes in that old clubhouse. Um, oh. If you go by and walk around, they've been training in it for months and they love the building for training. Um, they have done a lot of training with some of their new recruits and done some training sessions down there with, with other staff. Um, um, in this day and age, um, at least in Massachusetts, uh, DEP frowns on burning buildings down just um, because of the pollution that it causes. Also, there are residential, um, you know, neighborhoods very close to that building. So um, as much as I have hinted with our fire chief that that would be a, a wonderful exercise and a great practice it is, for, the, for, the, for the fire department, it is not something that is allowed um, and encouraged by DEP any longer in Massachusetts. So well, we I didn't to, mean burn it down, but but that's fine. So we are training. Already, yeah, using it, so we are training there. You'll yeah. see our staff there with fire trucks and axes and all sorts of equipment. There is a lot of holes in the in parts of the roof of that building because they've been practicing for months. Okay. Thank um, you. Yes. Any other questions? Because I have a couple. And Sandy, I'm seeing you have a. I did bring a quick one. Back. Dave, do you want this listed as conservation or planning? I think it's it's more broadly a planning um, yeah, a good. planning re re uh, request. Thank you. So my question, Dave, is um, it it currently or it did before it was no longer in use had bathrooms, water, and electricity. Um, coming into the building, um, and I don't know whether it was on sewer, are you going to, in, you, in taking it down, are you going to somehow preserve the fact that it has those connections that could potentially be used by something else? Um, because I know it's pretty costly to run all of that back in the circuitry. Um, and so that that's my general question. And the timing, I think you're in your write-up, you said it's a liability because the police also have to patrol it. So is that that vandalism or people trying to get in the building? Um, yeah, we we have had a lot of vandalism there, Kathy. And, um, and the police department has spent, unfortunately, too much time there in the past year or two. Um, but in answer to your first question, yes, absolutely. It does have water, sewer, and electricity. Um, as we demo, we will be working with our building department, our fire department, our DPW to make sure we preserve 
any and all utilities at the um, at the frontage so that those can be stubbed out for future future connections as needed. Um, so all of that will be worked out in the demo. Um, I will say that we are trying to save um, a significant amount of money. We have been fortunate enough to team up, and I was going to talk to the council about this uh, in a couple of weeks, but I'll just, because it's related to capital, part of the building system at Hickory includes a very large pump house for the irrigation system. And this is a significant building with uh, very large pumps and electrical um, uh, utility, et cetera. And so we are fortunate enough to team up with the state uh, on what's called an America the Beautiful grant. And so the state is going to, through that grant, uh, federal and state dollars, they're going to pay for the removal of the pump house and associated pipes, electrical uh, fixtures, et cetera. Um, and the reason for that is because it's very close to the Fort River. And so we were able to fold that into an environmental or ecological restoration proposal to remove that. I tried, believe me, my hardest to fold the clubhouse into that grant as well, but I was unsuccessful. They said it was too far from the Fort River. So so we're, we're trying to save money and uh, we were able, that's a very significant cost to take that uh, other building out and then restore the riverbank there. So we'll pay for that another way through the grant. Any other questions? And Sarah, your, your hand is up, but maybe it just didn't, that's okay, it just didn't go down. It doesn't have an automatic down, I don't think. Um, um, so Chris, Dave, Dave just, as you heard, Dave just did the clubhouse. So you, before we lost you, you said you had three projects. I don't know whether that was one of them, but you you can be back on if you would like. And I see Chris is here, but I don't know whether she hears us. Um, her connection was unstable, Kathy. So um, I don't know if it's froze up on her again. Oh, there she is. Okay. okay, I can I can see you now, Chris. You know, sometimes with the video on, it it drains a lot. So if you need to be a black screen and talk to us, you can. But welcome back. Uh oh, I think she just froze. Hang <laughs> out, saying internet um, unavailable. So. Well, now we can hear, hear you. you. Oh, you can, can hear, hear me. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Your conversation about the Civil War tablets. We did Civil War and we did the clubhouse at Hickory Ridge. So I asked for... Um, an implementation strategy that was done in 2016 and 2019 because we've had a lot of changes in our downtown. Um, we've had um, the North Common parking is now going to be gone. We have a few new mixed-use buildings and there are new uses in downtown such as the Drake and the Jones Library expansion. And we're also um, going to have a performance show on the Common. Um, and then uh, we've been asked to look at alternative locations for a new parking garage. We did do a study to show that the existing parking garage can accommodate some more um, parking spaces, but it's not a very large number. So um, anyway, that's that's my that's my request. Questions. Um, if I well, don't, I'm not sure I heard it all. I'm sorry, Chris was frozen again at this. So it's this is the hundred thousand for for um the parking study or the oh. that that correct, Chris? Just you can yeah. Not... Questions for the parking study. Yep. So the, being a parking garage study, or is well, it? It's also it's you can explain. But, okay. You know, it's, it's really evaluating parking in the downtown and trying to decide, do we need a garage? Because back in 2016 and 2019, Nelson and Nygaard said we did not need a new garage. They felt. Oh. I, I can fill in a little there. Nelson Nygaard. Uses. 
Sorry. We, lo we lost you again, Chris, but Nelson Nygaard concluded that we did not need a new parking garage. However, there continues to be lingering concerns from local businesses, the bid chamber, people who use our downtown are, you know, are there enough spaces? And I think Chris was alluding to the changes that have happened in downtown. We are changing configuration here with the North Common project. We're adding new project. We have Barry Roberts project on South Pleasant Street with 22 new units of residential housing. We have other new residential projects uh, planned for downtown. So kind of updating and getting current with the parking, the available parking, but also the parking demand in downtown. I think that's what this funding would help us assess. And part of that would be to look at, do we need a garage? Do we need a garage? And if so, you know, where would the logical spot for that be? We, we've we already done some of that preliminary work, but this would pull that all together. I say Bob's hand is up and then I have questions, Bob, after you. Yeah, the, the only question I or the only comment I have is that since a lot of this or m some of this at least is due to the new development downtown, um, I would think that we would want the developers to pay for some of this study. I mean, they're not providing parking spaces uh, for their tenants. Uh, and uh, therefore, it seems to me that they should be contributing. I know I realize we probably can't do it post hoc, but moving forward, maybe we should write that into any kind of agreements we have with these landlords. Chris, you can, do you want to respond? And I, I have oh. a segue on that as well. Yeah, so my response would be that um, I think that's a good idea. Um, but the mechanism for doing that probably wouldn't be through the permitting process. Um, the permitting goes through either the planning board or the zoning board of appeals, and they don't really have the ability to negotiate with um, developers about contributing money to a capital project. So that seems like it would be more in the realm of the town manager who would reach out to developers and, um, and work with them on that. Am I right about that, Dave? Yeah, I mean, it really falls, I think, in the category of impact fees. What are the impacts of those new developments? I mean, at the same at the same time, you know, just a good opportunity to remind folks of the of the positive impacts of those those new new buildings and their their uh, their impact on expanding our tax base. It's you know hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in expanded tax base when when we're building these new buildings in in our biggest village center. So sure. that's always the the, the trade-off. Sir, can I make a comment just on income pack fees before I, you know, so one of, um, as you probably remember, Chris, you know, like three years ago, five years ago, six years ago, um, I sent something into planning. There are towns and they've called them different things. Um, but they basically are impact fees. And the state at one point said, you can't really have them, but then they baked off if you could really show that it was a cost imposed on the town. But we don't have it in our, you're correct, we don't have that tool in our uh, toolbox. So it's a question of should we have the tool in the toolbox that I'm posing to you, and I don't need an answer right now. But I know we're, we're, we've been talking about what um, subtle or not so subtle changes in some of our bylaws or regulations might be helpful. So that that's just my one comment. And then the other is the the earlier study, two of them by the same firm, they actually didn't update as much as you would have liked in study number two, but they looked around town at lots of private lots and suggested that the town create a relationship with the people with the private lots so that you know from five o'clock on they could be used for public parking or some kind of public parking. And to my knowledge, that might have started but has never been done. Um, you know, to and and Amherst College, I think, is one of them with their big alumni lot, you know, on you know, whether it's broadcast or not, that one can park there. I don't know whether we can, but there's there's uh, lots that aren't 
you under and and they they counted those spaces. Uh, they didn't count the Amherst College spaces, but they counted a lot of those spaces. Some of which has disappeared as the buildings have been built. You know, they've been built on what was parking. Um, but I just wonder whether we shouldn't pursue some of that as opposed to study it again. Um, so that's my question of the study. Yeah, Sandy has his hand up, as does Sarah, as does Chris. Everyone's got their hand up. <laughs> yeah. So two things related to this. One, I just got a text from Jen Fontaine, who is listening. And uh, I think maybe she should be I'll bring her in. as a panelist. Because the second thing is she said that uh, Sean Mangano had started to work on that issue before he left. So I can imagine that that would be something that the next finance director will look at. Yeah, so that that was the person who I thought was starting to work on it. Hi, Jen. <laughs> Welcome. I'll bring Ray in while we're at it too. <laughs> Jen, do you have anything to add to that? I don't think so. Just that the town does have a, a working group for parking created. And we've been away from that for a little while in Sean's absence. But I think we're going to work towards getting that group back together to start looking at these things again. Okay, so Sarah and Chris both have their hands up. So do I go first? <laughs> um, so my because this is my first year on JCPC, this is prompt, prompted by this request because it's not designed to build something like for the library, the Civil War tablets we just talked about. It's just studies. And I mean, as worthy as those are, is that the kind of thing that can be funded this way with capital when it's not not obviously going to produce any capital improvement? Um, I can respond, or Chris, you can respond because this this has been a practice um, when when it gets to be a substantial amount um, to plan what to do has been something that's money has been given to the planning department. And a little bit, you heard some of it with DPW, which was, um, you know, he has money for a sidewalk study where he doesn't tell us what sidewalk he's going to study, <laughs> but it's it's there for not putting it in necessarily, but, but uh, working through the design. So Chris, maybe you want to respond and Dave on, on that it has come in under the label of capital because it's one-time funding rather than built into an operating budget of the department? That's right. We often do have requests um, of the cap Joint Capital Planning Committee to um, <clears throat> to authorize capital funds for studies. And I could go back and provide a list of those if you were interested in having that, but it is a typical um, thing that we do. I wanted to say in response to a previous question that Nate Malloy has had um, informal conversations with some of the landowners in the downtown area. I think he's spoken with um, Kurt Shumway and he's also spoken with Jeff Brown and others and um, perhaps the Joneses. Um, there's been a mixed response to using private land for um, public parking, um, the conversation has gone that, well, if you open up your parking lot to us, we can manage it for you and you will get some, you know, remuneration for, for our use of it. But um, some of the landowners have said, well, those parking spaces are part of a, con of a lease that we have with our tenants. And therefore, those parking spaces are, you know, 24 hours a day available for those tenants. So those people have been reluctant to participate in that kind of activity, which isn't to say that they might not change their mind in the future. Um, I think there was one, uh, and it might be Kurt Shumway, but I'm not sure, who has a place that is a residential place and um, that he may be interested in allowing people to park there during the day because his tenants park there at night. So, you know, that those conversations should be ongoing, I think, but we've had a mixed reaction to them so far. Thank you. Kathy, just if I could on the parking study, um, I I hear um, Sarah Sarah's question, and I think 
when possible, I think all departments try to do as much in-house work as they possibly can, whether it's on traffic, uh, feasibility on sidewalks, um, whatever it might be. I think there's only a certain amount of capacity that we can do with with our landscape architects, with our engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So it has been a practice, not only of the planning department, but many other departments, including, you know, certainly DPW, we we study feasibility of of new buildings, of new treatment plants, and we often, if it's not grant funded, we use capital funds for those design studies. And in this case, um, I hear what you're saying, Sarah, this might, you know, on the face of it, you might not think it, it would result in any capital, but it actually might if, for instance, we use capital money to study the feasibility of putting another deck on the Boltwood parking garage. And we put that to rest. Yes, you can put another deck on the parking garage. And we determined that through engineering, uh, an engineering study. So that is here. We have that data, whether the town decides to do that or look for parking in another direction like private lots or another garage, a public-private partnership, whatever it might be. So, so yeah, I, I hear you. We try to be very careful and not spend this money uh, in ways that won't be directly beneficial and, and lead to some capital improvement. But um, I understand some of the concern about uh, how many studies should we fund. So thank you. So are we ready to move to the next project? The yes. next, uh, are you? Yeah, okay. So the next project is in the same vein, planning consultants. Um, in the last few years, Sean Mangano had been putting aside of $50,000 for <clears throat> planning consultants for the planning department that we can um, use as things come along. And we have done that. Um, and this year we were going to ask for $100,000 um, to study different things. And among them are uh, housing opportunities, affordable housing, um, pre-planning for affordable housing. Like often we have a piece of land, the town might own a piece of land or the town might see a piece of land that might <clears throat> be suitable for affordable housing. And we have to do some work ahead of time to figure out if that piece of land is going to be suitable or not. So that's what that's about. Um, the gateway area, we studied the gateway area back a number of years ago, and we consider that the area between Kendrick Park and the university along North Pleasant Street. So the gateway area had been thought of as an area that could be developed for housing. So do we wanna go back and study that again? Um, the RG zoning district is a zoning district that is already fairly dense. And we've talked um, a number of times about um, creating areas within the RG that could have housing um, built there. Um, and we've also talked about rezoning parts of the downtown um, limited business district to allow more housing. So all of those things are lumped under um, studying opportunities for more housing. Then we have a general zoning uh, category where um, we would like to be able to hire consultants, mainly architects, to do some graphics and density studies for um, some of the projects that we're working on. In fact, right now we have a project where we're working on University Drive to um, perhaps rezone University Drive to allow more housing. And I think I have some money left over from a previous year that we could hire a local architect to study and produce uh, drawings of what it might look like along University Drive if we were to rezone it. But that So that's money that we already have. It's not a lot, but we would like to have a similar amount of money in the future to study other areas that we're considering rezoning. And one of them is East Amherst. Um, then we also have uh, all of our signage regulations are really outdated and we'd like to be able to hire um, a consultant to help us with the sign bylaw. Um, we also have the FPC zoning district, which um, is really obsolete, and we'd like to work on um, eliminating that. Um, we have the PRP zoning district. We'd like to consider allowing um, some housing in the PRP zoning district because it's not really being used for the 
use that it was initially proposed for. So all of these things are things that we're, you know, constantly churning and mulling about and talking about here in the planning department. And we do talk about some of them with the planning board, but we don't have enough money to kind of get get jumps get a jump start on on these things. So we're, we're asking for um, consulting money to do that. And that would mean hiring either a planning consultant or an architect to help us with some of those things. Lee. I know a planning board plans and therefore needs money for planning, but how is to what extent is there some kind of coordination between money spent on planning and larger desires to act on the consequences of what is planned? Uh, and if that's an inappropriate question, I withdraw it. I'm new to this committee and I'm desperately desiring not to be contentious. <laughs> You want Chris, me to answer that? Yeah. yeah, you just jump right in. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think an example of that is University Drive. Um, so last year, the planning board started talking about the fact that the town needs more housing and what kind of housing does it need. And then they started looking around town and thinking about areas in town that could be developed for more housing. So they got the idea that University Drive is a <clears throat> an undeveloped area to a certain extent. It's mainly one-story buildings on the west side and um, lots of parking, but um, there's not really much housing there. there Barry Roberts has built some, um, but they thought, well, how could we encourage more housing to be built here. So they've been talking about that since like last March, not necessarily focused on University Drive, but they started to focus in that area maybe towards the late fall. And then um, Mr. Roberts came along with this idea of building a building at the corner of Amity Street and University Drive. And at the same time, the university and the town are talking about um, building a roundabout at the intersection of Amity Street and University Drive. So all of these things are swirling around and we're thinking of applying for um, MassWorks grant to uh, allow that roundabout to occur. Um, and all of these things are very mm, intertwined. So in, in answer to Ms. Edwards' question, I think that part of our interest in University Drive and part of Mr. Roberts' interest in University Drive was like synergy. It came together. And so while the planning board is planning for that area, he has a specific idea for a specific project, which the planning board is encouraging. And that, by the way, just received a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals that will clear the way to allow that to be proposed and hopefully be um, approved. So I guess what I'm saying is all of these things kind of work together. And, you know, once the planning board says, oh, well, we want to focus on University Drive, then that kind of helps people to think, maybe I could propose something there. And um, so it's all part of a big process. And somehow, you know, it all works together and something good comes out of it. So I guess that's my answer to your question. So I, I want to follow it up, Chris, with, a, I think, well, last year or two years ago, there was a thousand dollars for design standards to work with a consultant, I think mainly for downtown. So I don't know whether we've spent all that money, but it seems like this is partly linked to that. And and just so everyone knows, the University Drive, the Barry Roberts, the variance is um, la letting him build taller than would normally be allowed in that area. So the thought was, should that whole area be rezone to allow this kind of of height you know so it it it's right now it's done by it was done by exception am i right chris it was done by exception for that specific project mm -hmm. um, but it would run down the corridor so i just you know th what you gave was a giant list of possibles including the gateway project which i still have the files on that where it was pretty well conceptualized. And then it was, there was um, 
a pushback from the people who lived near there. Um, but it was, you know, what could be there and it was envisioned. So, so do you have, I'm not going to put you on the spot to say, if you got a hundred rather than 50, do you have specifics you would work on in the next 12 month period that would use up all the money, you know, with some, these are the top priorities. And because it, it seems like they need different kinds of maybe one architect could be working on all of them, but they need different kinds of um, mindsets, including signage bylaws. You know, I mean, some of it is more a planner versus an architect. Um, so it's, it's, my question is about the bucket and whether you have specifics and you don't have to answer right now. I mean, it would be helpful if we write, if we move forward with this to just have an idea because flood flood prone conservancy, they're going to be, that's an FPC. Some, there's some going to be some groups that want to question that, you know, and is that at the top of the list? PRP may be at the top of the list, you know, on which things you're looking at that. So, and standing in the way of development is partly what you're looking at, you know, what's the design mm -hmm. of them and what, where could there be housing? Um, so that that's my complicated question. Um, so I think I would like, um, I can, you know, give you an answer off the top of my head right now, but I think I'd prefer to talk to Dave Zomek and Rob Mora and other people in the planning department and focus on, you know, which things that we think are the higher priorities among these um, things that I've laid out here. The, the reason that Sean Mangano had been setting aside the $50,000 for us is because we can't always judge, you know, when we're planning for capital expenditures in this way a year ahead that we're going to need money for something. So he was essentially saying, well, we're going to earmark this $50,000 for you and you use it for the things that come up during the year. And these are all things that have been churning around in the planning department, but we haven't had the time or the, you know, focus and the money to um, tackle them. But how about if I talk to Dave and Rob Mora and other people in the planning department and get back to you about the things that um, I think would be most useful if, you know, if we had $50,000 this year, to, next year rather, to go ahead. So, so thank you. That's great. I didn't, as I said, I didn't want to put you on the spot um, so um, if I might, uh, Kathy, Chris, could you just clarify on my list, I have $50,000 in FY26 and 28. Do I have the right ask on my sheet? I think you're looking at a an Excel spreadsheet. Is that yes. right? Yeah. So that's something that um, Sean put together and he was putting Fifty thousand dollars in out years for that. Um, yeah. I, what I've been talking about tonight or today is what are we asking for for FY twenty five? So you are asking for fifty in twenty five, and fifty in twenty six, and fifty in twenty eight. That's what I have on my spreadsheet. Well, I was asking for a hundred thousand dollars in twenty five. Now we could say that um, given. I get it. Okay. Yeah. That's what I yep. needed to yeah, know. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's, that's right. Yep. Okay. So um, how should we handle this? I will meet with Dave and Rob Mora and Nate Malloy and talk about this topic and get back to you. And should I respond to Kathy? Um, um, we respond, send it through either Sandy or Athena, Chris, and then okay. we can, um, then we can, post a response and rather than through me. All right. I mean, I mean if you could send it to Sandy, why don't you send it to Sandy and he'll figure mm -hmm. out how to put it in the bucket. Um, okay, good. I will do that. Thank you. So is that, I think that that's did, all for FY25 for planning. Yes. Okay. So we have Stephanie and um, Ray. Um, Dave, what, which order are we going next? Well, I believe. Stephanie? We, well, we might be able to knock off conservation very quickly. I think there's a little confusion in my mind about we may not all be looking at the same spreadsheets, but I believe 
uh, once we consolidated the ask for the clubhouse at um, Cher uh, Cherry Hill uh, uh, Hickory under planning, there's only one FY25 request in conservation. Am I correct on that? Which is uh, for dam and dike work at Puffer's Pond, $150,000? Um, I'm not sure we had that one. We but oh, do we have it, Bob? We have it. But okay. we also have a sustainability project for town hall. Yes, and Stephanie can speak to that. But I was just going to knock off the puffer spawn uh, item real quickly because that's the only FY25. And I think you're mainly okay. focused yeah. on 25. There's yeah. more work to be done in the out years. So very quickly on conservation, um, we are, after many years of, of, uh, of, of being a little bit on the sidelines, if you will, at Puffer Spawn, we're finally getting some traction. Uh, Stephanie, Aaron Jock, our wetlands administrator, myself, and some others, uh, with the help of Bob Parent, who is our um, uh, our consulting engineer, if you will, um, are doing some work on Puffer's Pond. Our focus there uh, is really three three areas. Um, of course, one is the dam, one is the dike, and one is dredging. You, uh, the JCPC has heard about dredging for many years. There, we are a few years away from dredging. So I'm not gonna talk much about that. What I wanna talk about is dam repair and dike repair. Um, so the, currently the dike at Buffers Pond um, is in poor condition uh, and the dam is in fair condition. Both structures are rated, if you will, by the, um, by the Office of Dam Safety in Boston. Um, uh, I believe both are high hazard. The dam is a high hat, what we call a high hazard dam and the dike as well. And so what really concerns me is the condition of the dike, which is in poor condition. We have not spent much money at all on the dike, perhaps no money on the dike through the years. And um, we now need to really focus on that. So the, the request of $150,000 is to begin to seed that work. Um, uh, we, are, we have been doing dam and dike assessments right along those are required by the state so we have a pretty good idea of what needs to be done to both the dam and the dike to bring them up to state standards um, by the way there is no concern about public safety at this point with either structure you know um, there's no immediate concern about public safety i should say um, what the focus is now, we are uh, in the process. We have a grant that we are putting together. It is due a week from tomorrow to the Office of da uh, the Dam and Seawall Program. And we are going for a grant of about $300,000, $350,000 to um, do the engineering and design for improvements and repair to the dam and dike. And... Um, we need matching funds for that grant. Again, if we're successful, we think we have a very good chance of getting that grant. Um, we've been working closely with the Office of Dam Safety in Boston. They would very much like us to be successful. And and so, um, you know, we're feeling pretty good about that. We're working with an engineering firm, Fuss and O'Neill, um, a local firm, and they are putting together that grant with us. So, um, the $150,000 would help with our local match. Um, we would need to match that grant if we got it on the order of sixty-five dollars to $85,000. And then there, in all likelihood, will be other associated costs. The grant will do a number of things. We'll assess and come up with a design for dike improvements. We'll assess and come up with any improvements that the dam needs. Uh, this will include things like bathymetry. If you're familiar with bathymetry, it means basically getting the depth of the pond in all of all locations in the pond. We'll be looking at the depth of the sediment in the pond. We'll be putting a diver in the pond to assess the emergency flow gate in the dam. There is a there is an emergency uh, uh, release valve in in Puffer's Pond in the event of a major storm event. Um, we can lower the uh, level of the pond. Uh, we have not exercised that um, that gate in some time because we're not sure of all the, the structural integrity of that gate. So we're going to put a diver in the pond. So that just gives you a flavor. If we're successful with the grant, those are some of the, the things that we will be doing. Eventually, as part of this project, we'll also be assessing not only the depth of the sediment in Puffer's Pond, 
that will help us determine how much dredging needs to happen there, but we'll also assess the sediment to make sure um, there is nothing dangerous in those sediments. So this is all part of a much larger project, but the first phase of that is to apply for this grant and we're looking for matching money and also money. We think we'll need money beyond the match to, to do all of the work that I just mentioned. So I think I'll stop there. Happy to take questions and then hopefully we can go over to Stephanie for sustainability. Lee, I'm just curious. I think I know where the dam is, but where is the dike in Puffer's Pond? Excellent question. Um, uh, the dike is rather subtle. The dike yeah. is um, to the west. So uh, okay. as you're facing the dam, we now have a nice new bridge there and a, and a sidewalk. You, you're looking straight at the dam. You then have the rock outcroppings that many young people, uh, right of passage, <laughs> jump off. Behind the rock, rock outcropping is the dike. Mm -hmm. The dike is about 70 feet long. It's it's an earthen dike, and it is designed to, to hold back water uh, in the event of a large um, um, uh, weather system, uh, uh, a large flow. And we know that that dike from previous assessments, we know that that dike has been undercut and we need to do pretty significant repair on the dike. The dam is in much better condition, as I mentioned, um, and we have been doing some some gradual uh, repair on the, on the dam over time, but we do need to look closely at that emergency release uh, apparatus. Thank you. Other questions? I, I guess my one, Dave, is if you, and it sounds like you, you're you optimistic, if you get the larger grant, is that enough to re, to do the repairs or is that just the design? You said design. That's just, that's just the design. So I'm, um, okay, this is a larger question about the town's capital capacity. Um, you know, if, if we decide we've got a major repair and here's the elements of it. Is there a huge grant available from the state? Because yeah. I mean, if people know where this dam is, if it should break or the dike or that release valve shouldn't work, there's a huge number of apartments that'll be underwater. We're, well, I want to make sure we we frame this correctly. And that's why I said there is no immediate, immediate danger to the public, because I know there may be public listening. So the dam is in fair condition, which actually most dams in Massachusetts are in fair condition. Very few, very few dams in Massachusetts are in excellent condition. So the dam is structurally sound. We get it assessed by engineers who specialize in dam safety. I believe we're required every two years to do that. We do that. The dike um, does need some work, but um, I, I'm trying to, to frame this correctly. Um, there is no immediate danger of either structure giving way and and uh, being a danger to those people living downstream. This is more that the dike has not received attention over time. Um, it is it is it is not the central structure that holds back water. The dam holds back water. The dike is at a low point in the in the terrain uh, to the left of the of the cliffs, as I mentioned. And so that is more about keeping the water ponded in the pond. But again, there's no there's no danger of either structure giving way. This is partly to, uh, we have some deferred maintenance we need to do on both of them, and it's time to do that. Kathy, I also wanted to point out that there are, there are significant uh, grants available for repair and construction related to dam, dams that need repair. So this would not all be on the town. We're gearing up for that. So we need to do some of this work to understand what we need to do to design that work and then go after some grants. And yes, we might come back to the town. Obviously, we would come back as part of the town capital pro process in the future. I also want to separate the work we do on the dams is critical to long-term public safety. Whether we dredge or not is a community decision. Um, uh, that is that's a different that's a different discussion. We we need to maintain the dams over time. I think we should dredge, but I think that's a broader conversation that we can have in future years. 
but we're a couple of years away from tackling that one. Yeah, I see Anna, Anna, your hands up. You're yeah. Well, Dave, I think you just answered it. Um, we've been on a couple or Dave and Bob and I were on a couple calls this week with um residents talking about municipal vulnerability grants. And it sounds like from what you're saying, that would be part of stage two of this, of once we have the a plan, if we decide to move forward, then you would apply for an MVP grant, or is the dams grant that you were talking about kind of part of that program? And if none of the above, would this qualify for an MVP grant? Um, I'm going to defer to Stephanie on that. There are elements of the future work at Buffer Spawn that might qualify for an MVP grant. I don't know. I don't know. Stephanie may know whether the actual physical improvements to the dike and dam would qualify, but we have been in touch with the MVP program. They're well aware that we are doing this. We're looking at Puffer's Pond as a resiliency element of our community, as a cooling center, if you will, for people now and in the future. So all of that is being talked about between and among staff, but also state agencies. But Stephanie, I just don't know off the top of my head whether dam improvements, dike improvements can be funded through MVP. There are other dam safety related grants that are specific to fixing dams and dikes. It's, and sorry, Steph, uh, before Stephanie goes, just it is kind of a moot point in some ways because you're talking about these other grants that you're able to chase. Um, I think it's this is a bit more of me trying to wrap my head around where the town is going for these different projects. So I, I appreciate the responses. Thanks. Okay. We are we we have gotten MVP grants for and we have some ongoing uh, for uh, uh, culvert removal and culvert replacement on streams. But Stephanie can speak to MVP and the dam and dike uh, repair. Stephanie, why don't we segue right into you because I think Perfect. that's the next project as well. Um, so as far as MVP, I will say that they've been more focused on infrastructure work and our initial conversations with them about Puffer's Pond has not yielded much, let's say, um, confidence that they would support <laughs> okay. that that project. So I think we've had to look elsewhere for um, other opportunities outside of MVP. Thank you so much, both Dave and Steph. So Stephanie, you have a proposed um, $325,000, is that right, for sustainability? Um, yes. That's what's on my list, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, um, and I think it, it just shows up as a single amount is that correct? Yes. Uh, it, yes, it okay. does. All right. Um, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, I had actually tried to break this out a bit, and I had actually reduced the amount to two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, so I can cover um, how I broke that down. Um, so, I hate to start with this, <laughs> but one hundred and fifty thousand was for um, engineering studies and consultants. <laughs> And um, I, I hear, uh, I certainly hear um, some of, you know, Lee's concerns about this, but I want to reiterate what Chris has said, that in many cases, we can't get funding for projects for grant funding unless we have the engineering studies done. And that's especially true with the, the energy efficiency work. Um, a lot of that work requires engineering studies to show that it's needed. So um, I will say that Right now, we're focused on the town hall in Munson Library. I've been working very closely with Jeremiah LaPlante to sort of figure out how we can tackle town hall. As long I've I've been with the town for 27 years, and as long as I've been working for the town, there's been an issue with the fact that there's not sufficient insulation in the roof, and um, that it really makes a difference. And you know, also we know that as time goes on. Uh, these things don't get less expensive, <laughs> they get more expensive. So I'm feeling like the time is now, we shouldn't be waiting and putting these things off. So one of the things that I've done for this year is to get um, a Metagrant study just to look at the attic space. So the Metagrants for $15,000, we're looking at that now, but what it's going to be focused on is how we can weatherize, weatherize that portion of town hall 
it's very complicated because it's it's pitched very steeply, as you well know. Um, but it's also there's a very very thin um, amount of insulation, but otherwise it's basically unheated space, and there's a lot of scaffolding. And so we just want to figure out, um, and really it's going to take an engineer to really come in and take a look at it to figure out, first of all, what we have to do to weatherize that space and then also how we can weatherize that space, especially with the fact that we'll need to access various parts of it that are currently workspace. So it's going to be rather challenging and complicated. So we really need to have someone do that. So um, we also want to use some of those funds for the weatherization. So I think the study itself probably won't take that long. So it's quite feasible that we can um, do the weatherization implementation part over the next, you know, FY25. Um, so also looking at uh, Munson Library, similarly, as we try to transition our buildings off fossil fuels, we need to have studies again in order to get funding to purchase the equipment. It's very expensive, um, and I'm not, and really any any heating cooling system is expensive at this point for our municipal facilities. So, not to say that these are more expensive. It's just that we need the studies in order to justify getting additional grant funding because certainly this amount of funding alone is not going to do much. And even with the funding that Jeremiah has requested. Um, you know, it's it's just getting more and more expensive to address building needs. And especially if we're trying to transition off fossil fuels, I'm our approach is that what I'm doing is asking for funding for the studies and the weatherization that has to happen for the buildings to make them more efficient. So Jeremiah is fo focusing more on the structural needs, but I'm focused more on weatherization and building studies. So right now, our two focused over the next year would be for Town Hall and Munson Library. And similar to Chris, we sort of don't know exactly what we'll need, but we want to be able to have the flexibility to um, do a study and then act on it as soon as possible. So um, that's the 150000 A 50000 would be additional project funding to help um, bridge the gap for uh, other departments that are seeking some other capital requests. For instance, um, the fire department had purchased an ambulance and we supported them with $25,000 from sustainability to get them some equipment that would uh, treat that building, that equipment more like a hybrid vehicle. So it actually, um, you know, is able to um, operate without running the the car while or the vehicle while they're trying to do other work and they can use this equipment to sort of help um, a battery backup to help keep the vehicle running. Um, so that's one example. And then um, I had also asked for, um, let's see, $20,000 for engineering pertaining to solar installation projects. So again, we don't have these identified um, specifically yet, but if we wanted to do um, a carport, for instance, or solar solar port canopy, um, we would need to have the engineering study to support the construction of a solar canopy. So this is just, again, allowing us some opportunity specifically aimed at solar installations for um, canopies or other municipal buildings. So um, those studies would be needed as well. Uh, then there's $15,000 uh, and ask for the Valley Bike um, Capital. Valley Bike is coming back online and we have one more station to install and um, that station will require a concrete pad. Uh, some of that work in the past has come out of uh, transportation. There's also an admin fee that gets paid to um, Northampton every year. And forgive me if I'm asking for this in the wrong category, whether that's operating or capital. I just have felt over time that this really should live with sustainability and that, um, you know, the uh, having it under transportation, I understand the reason and the rationale, but somehow it feels like it should be with sustainability and supported by sustainability funding um, to keep that that system um, 
expanding and growing and to cover the expenses for the admin costs that's paid to Northampton. And then the last, I'm sorry, the last $15,000 uh, is for um, infrastructure for the community gardens. The two existing that we have are the Fort River Farm and Amethyst Brook. And then also we're exploring uh, maybe establishing uh, additional gardens um, and potentially if we are going to look to, uh, we haven't decided exactly where or concretely that it would be at Hickory Ridge, but if we were to begin the process at Hickory Ridge, we would like to have some funding to sort of get that established. Um, that might be a bit premature for Hickory Ridge, but certainly for the other two, um, there's just a lot of needs. Water, you know, water resources are very difficult. So even if we don't put in any kind of um, specific infrastructure as in a well, uh, even having cisterns or some other water catchment system would be beneficial to the gardeners. And in this case, I will say that, you know, what I'm discovering in working with the gardens more closely now is that this really is a food security issue, certainly at Fort River Farm. Um, you know, quite a few of our gardeners live at Colonial Village and they don't have access to mm. a place to garden. So um, that funding would be, that 15,000 would be used to sort of broadly cover the community gardens. And I think that's all of the capital, and that should be two hundred and fifty thousand. Stephanie, uh, this is Bob. I just I'm on the um, minute taker. Could you just run through those numbers again? Absolutely. Just to make sure I put the right numbers with the right projects. Sure. Thank you. One hundred and fifty thousand for engineering studies and consultants and implementation for weatherization of municipal buildings. Um. 20,000 for engineering studies pertaining to solar installation of municipal projects. Uh, 15,000 Valley by Capital for infrastructure for a new station and admin support to the city of Northampton. 50,000 for um, bridging the gap for more efficient um, equipment for buildings and vehicles. And then 50, 15,000 for um, community garden infrastructure and supplies. Okay, thank you. And that's, and that's a total of 250, which you said at the beginning on our sheet, it actually, the 325 showed up twice, Sandy. So there's, in the spreadsheet, there's also some savings of that because it showed up under recreation also. Um, but so that that is the total ask for... FY25. Correct. Okay. Lee. Could you just clarify one thing for me? The 15,000 for the Valley bike is to add additional, an additional station, but there's, how much is the annual administrative fee? The administrative fee is uh, roughly around um, $7,000. And that's the total cost we have to put in for our Valley Bikes? That's just the administrative fee that's annually paid to Northampton that we've been paying since we started. Yeah. The operating costs are something entirely different. That's mm -hmm. the big one. Could you just remind me what that number is? Uh, that one, um, for this year, well, this year it was less, but for FY25, um, it would be about $80,000. Excellent. Thank you. And what budget does that come out of? That's a good question. We're working on that. <laughs> and I will I will say, I mean, that's that's the amount that we'd actually be like in the worst case scenario without any memberships or sponsorships or anything. That's how much it would be. It's very likely to be less, but I will say I would anticipate it not to be less than the fifty thousand range. And we're we are the group is really working on trying to get the state to help support that. Um We've grown to eight communities. We started with five, we grew to eight and we have more, we have at least two more that are wanting mm -hmm. to join. So we really feel like the state needs to identify this as, you know, it's not recreational, it's transportation. Um, it's located near dense housing uh, development and it's really seen as a way for people to get around, not just to go on a joyride. Lee. Uh, thank you. Uh, I repeat, I'm very new to this committee and I'm trying to learn how it operates. And, and I am certainly not 
in any way at all hostile to planning and spending money on planning. But I'm what I'm hoping I will one of the things I'm hoping to learn as I sit on this committee is what is the relationship of planning activities to ultimate carrying out of the things for which the planning activities have been engaged and and how how is that process managed that's what I'm interested in but but I I definitely Right, I definitely believe if you decided you're interested in doing something, then you need to figure out what it will cost to do and, and you need to hire planners. So it, I just wonder if there's always a connect between planning activities and carrying out something as opposed to planning activities. Sometimes you plan for things and what you learn is your plan is impractical. It won't work. And then sometimes it's just a dead end because it was clear for whatever reasons that this project was never going to happen. So that's what my concerns are. I would say that these projects that are being proposed um, are, um, I, I, it's very unlikely we'll do a, a study and have a response that it's an impractical or we can't do it. I mean, the, these things are very straightforward. This is about weatherization and transitioning off fossil fuels, what, meaning that we're, you know, looking to to install heat pumps, if you will, because mm -hmm. we're looking to electrify all of the municipal buildings. So that is going to take funding and commitment of the town to have that happen. Um, but yeah, these studies are required, you know, you, you really need the studies in order to do that, especially if you're transitioning off, you know, like an oil system. So I, but so they're very practical, at least the studies that I'm proposing um, are very concrete. Dave and Chris both had responses on this. Dave? So yes, I I might have misinterpreted the question, but were you asking about kind of broader planning, community planning? How does all of that connect and and lead to projects? Maybe. Or or was it specifically to sustainability projects? No, it was the broader question. I, I that I raised my hand. Yeah. I took it down. Well, Absolutely, can, it I was can, not about I, these specifically. But okay, there's can, a lot of requests coming in for planning and I'm right. just trying to figure that out. Thank so you. So very, very briefly, because I know you have other departments, um, very briefly. So so coming from certainly we work from the town manager's goals that are provided by and 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 uh, provided by the town council and those flow through department heads to our staff and they should flow out to boards and committees. Um, in conservation and development, which includes uh, sustainability, facilities, uh, planning, zoning, conservation, inspection services. We work with all the different departments throughout town. We we have a close working relationship with the recreation department, with the DPW. So when we plan, we look at what are those community needs stated by the town council, by various boards and committees. The planning board would like to see, for instance, more housing in town. How do we achieve that? To do that, we might study, as Chris indicated, the university drive stretch. Could that be densified? Um, we work with DPW when um, when residents say they would like a um, they would like a sidewalk on um, North Ple East Pleasant Street. We work with DPW to say, okay, what planning processes, what permitting processes would a sidewalk need to happen and, and get uh, built on, on uh, East Pleasant Street? Likewise, uh, the, one of the goals of the town council was they would like to see a permanent shelter. Well, the shelter, Craig's Doors, has been without a permanent home. They've been moving from church to church to church for 10 or 15 years. So we set out to find a piece of property. We bought a piece of property, we the town. Uh, through ARPA funds, and now we're in a planning process to help uh, put out an RFP, a request for proposals for a, for a firm to come in and build a shelter with supportive housing. So everything flows from the town council, from our boards and committees, 
And then uh, with the goal of trying to make our community a better place for people to work, live, and and raise their children. So um, there's a lot of interdepartmental communication and planning, as well as even with the schools. Um, as we look at the new Fort River School, I'm sure many people in our community are saying, well, when the Wildwood School is, um, is, uh, is vacant, that will be a planning exercise, not necessarily specific to the planning department, but the planning department and many other departments will be part of that planning department to reimagine what could happen in that building or on that site. So that's my brief. So Chris, I see you, you have a response as well. I just wanted to say that our planning projects don't always lead to the town having to build something or spend money to do something. Often our planning um, efforts and projects lead to someone else building something. So, you know, you don't have to worry that all of these planning efforts are going to result in the town having to spend a lot of money. You know, Barry Roberts might spend a lot of money or Wayfinders might spend a lot of money. Developers might spend a lot of money if they see an opportunity to build something good. Thanks. So one of the things with Stephanie's money, at least in the past, um, is she's been able to leverage the money to get other money, you know, that so, so it's going specifically into um, on the way to getting us. She's a one person department for sustainability is what people should know. Quite, uh, quite an amazing one person. <laughs> but so Lee, your hand is up again. Yes, I just want to repeat. I'm not worried. I'm just curious. And I'm trying to understand the, how the process works. And I have learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dave, that I think next is recreation, unless I'm I'm wrong on my list. Yes, and I believe Ray is here and is I'll he? let Ray take the lead and, and I'm happy to support him in any way I can. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you all for having me over here. Uh, uh, I think that we have a relatively uh, straightforward, easy pitch here. I've got two projects on the docket. I can talk about one, which is a purchase. Uh, they're both Cherry Hill uh, related. Uh, one is a, uh, is a greens mower. Um, and I don't remember if I had an opportunity to shift that, that, cost to 30,000, 30, 35,000, um, if it was submitted in at 30 and 35 or the larger number that I had originally put in. Um, uh, originally we were asking for, it's basically a three step, uh, uh, three different levels where we we're looking at, we figured we put in the, the most expensive one and let you all figure it out. There was a, there was a request for a new uh, 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 environmentally friendly, uh, uh, a, 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 a new mower that would that would uh, cost I think up to sixty five thousand. There was a second one which was new and a, a newer model of the one that we have right now. Uh, we it's going to be difficult for us to buy new, and we figured the cost also. We put in the request for a for a used mower. The the uh, greens mower basically mows the area at the at Cherry Hill around the tea around the tea boxes and the greens. Um, the it would be replacing a 2008 mower that uh, we bought that Cherry Hill purchased uh, a long time ago and has basically outlived its its life. It still works. Uh, knock on wood, it'll be working tomorrow. Um, we're opening up and we're, we have a soft open this weekend. Uh, it's going to be a little bit wet. Uh, but we have a, you know, we're we're hopeful that it that it's going to continue to do its job here. Uh, uh, maybe even through this through this year, we won't be disposing of that. That would basically move to a backup, to an extra piece for us. But uh, it has it's absorbed a lot of of uh, attention as we're looking to try and repair. It's absorbed a lot of. Uh, financial hits and and repairing it over the course of the last couple of years. So part of this is its shelf life, and part of it is trying to maintain the amount of money that we're spending to try and keep it operational. 
Um, and the the used spot at thirty to thirty five thousand dollars that that used slot is is I think relatively friendly for for what we're looking for here. We were looking; it was our intention when we put it in to add the the full cost for sustainability purposes. Um, but that may be difficult to find right now, and certainly find at a point where we where we can use it. So that the the first ask is for a greens mower um, uh, that will be reliable for us, predictably reliable for us at the at the golf course for this season uh, when we when we get it. I can stop there and and find out if there's any clarification or any questions on that. Um. So, you know, so this is. Um, it's it's Cherry Hill, this greens mower, and um, you're now saying it's a thirty thirty five thousand. Correct. Okay. On one give thing, it, we had we, something nearer to seventy, but that's okay. I'm, yes, I'm just confirming that that's what we're talking about. I, okay. I want to make sure that we're that the the ask now is for thirty thirty five thousand because we're looking in the used market. We think we can get something in the used market which doesn't fill our goals. We did. I, I put uh, John Coelho on the on the uh, task of looking for sustainability, looking for looking to try and uh, we were looking at at new mowers to begin with, knowing that we had options for used. I think used is going to be the way that we are going to have to go, from what I understand. Sarah has a question. Yeah. First of all, thank hi Ray. Thanks for um, looking into into used. Um, appreciate that effort. Um, I'm not a golfer, so to me, a lawn mower is a lawn mower. <laughs> is this is this um, greens mower? Is it something that can be used on other fields in town, athletic fields, or are there other? Or is it really need to be dedicated? Are you like mowing daily to keep the greens? The yeah. Yes, there's a lot of access during the season. There's there's a it's used out on the uh, course a lot. Um, every time, if you imagine it, every time the grass grows a little bit, it's specialized for those areas. It's the finer of the mowers. We we got a used rough mower last year, the year before, and that one is a big machine that is also used a bunch, but it's mm -hmm. but it's less special. It's it's less uh, delicate. It's less of an of an art piece essentially. Um, the 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 greens mower is one that is is used much more for the manicuring of the of those special uh, 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 particularly particularly important areas of the and I say particularly not being more but in but particularly important areas of the golf course. Um, so it's a precision. It's, it's a precision. Correct. Machine. Yes. Okay. There, it also cuts on a green. The grass is not very high. Yeah. It's, very, very short. Yeah. Think, think of it as like a carpet and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this thing. Maybe, is, maybe a Roomba. I don't know. <laughs> as a, as a long time, as a long time high school field hockey coach, I can tell you that, that at some point the, the, you know, you know people, the schools or whoever, as they try and find out what's going on with, with, turf and stuff there they they would be looking for something very similar because field hockey is the looks for manicured yeah. uh, similarly manicured greens that you can't just run out there and throw a bunch of big uh, you know there's there's restricted access in terms of carts on the spaces that the greens more covers it's it is specialized it does cut very very finely and that's why we've had to put money into repairs on that okay thank you Bob, was your hand up as well? No. Yep. Okay, you can go to the next project. And this is the this is the unique second project is one that uh, a lot of times I come in here for the capital and I start asking for like like toys for the for the Cherry Hill, uh, asking for important equipment. This one is a little bit different. It's our bridge project. Uh, uh, at the foot of the tee box or the first tee box is a small cart path uh, for folks who know the course, know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a small cart path there, which is important for uh, uh, for us to get equipment out to the course. It's a, 
it's a uh, it crosses a little stream it's important for us to be able to get any equipment out to the cores our grounds crew uses that a ton but of course also it is foot traffic from the first tee box to the course it's it's access to the whole course in front of us what happens when it rains and i don't have to tell you all that it's been raining a lot uh and it's been raining a lot over the course of the last few years the um, what happens is more often now uh, than 10 years ago is that bridge, uh, that the, the water basically floods it off of its moorings and it gets lifted off of, off of its space. And then sometimes, not forever, not, not always, it's been probably about, in my two plus years, it's probably been about four or five times, but they're costly. We have to. We have if the if it gets unmoored and then dislodged, it floats down the stream. Um, uh, and when that happens, uh, you know, if it's just kind of right there, then they can try and grab it and pull it back. But what happens is uh, we lose opportunity for money in two different ways. We lose it because we have to get somebody. It's not something that we can that my grounds crew can go out and go and pick it up and pull it back or whatever, and just sort of put it back in and snap it back into place. Uh, we have to get somebody uh, with tools and a specialist to go and get it and to bring it back. So it costs us to get somebody outside, get to get outside service to go and retrieve it. And it also, when that bridge is gone, we don't have access to the course. We have to shut the course down until it's, until it's solved. Thankfully, sometimes it's in, it's in times if it's, if we've had that much rain, then the the issue is that it's probably going to be a little while before we open anyway. So it's not a direct cost there. Probably, you know, we might be closing anyways because the amount of water that the course takes, but we can't open the course until, until that bridge is put back into place. Um, there is, we looked at last year because it started to happen a little bit more. Um, we looked at the possibility of just reversing the course and going out backwards because there's another there's another bridge towards the end of the the course and just basically having people go out and come back but that traffic uh, uh, we were we tried to look into that and it just made no sense and it was a danger because you have people walking into uh, uh, into oncoming uh, 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 I think it was, I think, what is it, court, uh, the seventh hole, it has people walking into oncoming uh, balls being hit. And and so there's just all sorts of risk in doing that. We had, When the bridge is out on one, we have to shut the course down. Um, but so, so not without trying to find other opportunities there, that it, it does cost us in those two different ways. Uh, we brought Dave out to take a look at it. At one point, we did we did want to try and get a little bit of of you know planning expertise and and sort of inform Town Hall and let them know what we were working with and what we we're trying to solve there. And uh, essentially, we're at a space right now where we're looking to try to uh, engineer at least a makeshift trap for that for that bridge to keep it in place. Um, uh, I, 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 we were warned a couple of years ago that that you know this may end up happening over and over again. I liken it to sprained ankles, where once the once you sort of do a little bit of damage on it, then all of a sudden those moorings become a little bit weaker and a little bit weaker to the point where it just it'll keep on going and it'll keep on going when when something like this happens. Um, but we're trying to find a way to counter that and engineer a solution to keep that in place there are restri there there are certainly restrictions to what we can do cost friendly uh the the amount of of, of uh, i know there's mechanical limitations to how we can do it because it is a short uh it is a sort of a short turn in a short space to try and to try and operate in but the request here is to try to come up with a solution an uh, engineered solution for uh an increasingly costly uh problem for us and the price tag on it ray because one place it said 15 and another it said 40 i think so I, it's, I think i put 40 in it in there because that was a that was a ballpark estimate that dave 
that Dave provided me for putting it into ask. It's hard because we don't, it's, it really is a, a planning estimation at this stage. Yeah, if I could add just, yeah, Ray did a great job of, of describing that. Um, just to add a little, a few technical things. One, it is a perennial stream. This is a perennial stream. So it flows, it has a very significant watershed. And hence with all the rain, as Ray said, uh, these increasingly frequent storms, flashy storms, um, this thing gets unmoored. And I will say it takes a, um, a front end loader to go get it. Uh, 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 people cannot pick this up and, and, and replace this bridge. So that's where the cost is. You know, um, and and we can't just call on DPW every time it rains and say, "Hey, boy, our bridge is is uh, 50 yards down the stream. Come on into the mud and the swamp and get it, and then get your front end loader stuck." So Ray has had to often um, hire somebody to go in there and pick it up and put it back. So this is an effort to try to come up at least for a longer term. Here, um, you know, we're not talking about a a large bridge here that has to hold uh, cars or anything. It's a golf cart bridge that pedestrians also walk over and Ray's staff uses for maintenance equipment. So um, we, we're going to try to do the best we can with that $40,000 and get some time here. And if we get a, you know, a 10 year solution, we also would need some permitting uh, to bring that through the conservation commission. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the project. Uh, Sarah, your hand went up. And then it went down because my question was about permitting. <laughs> okay. They answered that. Thank and you. If people want, um, this is right near my house. I'll take a picture of the bridge. And depending on the season, I wear my wading boots when I go across the bridge because it's not just that it goes downstream, but it goes underwater. <laughs> um, so so I think I think that is it for the projects, you know, on an original spreadsheet, we had a war memorial and a Mill River playground, but they're not, they're no longer on for FY, on, on some one of the really early ones, Sandy. So they're not here, right? We were, we were looking, I, I see Sandy's trying to get in. Sandy, go first. So I was going to ask about that because it's still on my spreadsheet. So are those no longer being proposed? Yeah, um, I think that I uncovered, and it's probably, I'm almost certain that it's my mistake. Uh, I I think I uncovered when I was trying to reproduce after our department hearing. Uh, I was looking at the presentation on the board and thinking, these are old numbers. This is, the, this. it was weird for me trying to catch up to that. I think I think that was submitting the, the five-year plan on, um, and it got caught in my drafts. The, all of the projects that we were asking for, which are these two, were submitted in the submissions, but I think you were operating on an old spreadsheet. Um, so does that mean that in the next five years, these are not <clears throat> an ask at all? Um, I shared the, the actual five-year plan. I have it up here right now. We've got uh, uh, the clubhouse carpeting and a fairway unit for next year. Um, we are talking, I know the conversation about pond dredging came up here earlier, and that's a larger discussion, but that's, I have that slated in for 27. And those are the projects that I, that I know I have. Uh, I think we were so, talking about a different pond. Though, I know, right? I know, I know. I, <laughs> a much bigger uh, pond. Uh, and so, and so but, the, the issue about pond dredging at, at Cherry Hill has, I know has been something that we've sort of okay. put out there and brought back and the need or is, how far can we push that down the road? Uh, I'm being encouraged to keep that on the, on the- well, uh, I'll look at your submission, but in terms of the War Memorial and the playground at Mill okay. River, those are not on your five-year ask. I, I think they should be on the five-year ask. Ray and I have been mm -hmm. chatting a little bit about those. So just real quick on Mill River, we have some CPA funds to do a design, a conceptual design for new playground equipment and a new playground at Mill River. Um, we have not had the bandwidth to embark on that yet. So my hope is to do that later in this calendar year. So I think that's should be added in, in the out years, either under recreation or, or, or I don't know where that sits, whether it's with Ray's budget or with Amy in, in uh, recreation, Amy and Alan. But then okay. the, the war memorial effort is certainly well underway. We are designed, we are in the midst of a 
designed for the bathhouse and the surrounding area around the War Memorial Pool. And so that should, an ask should be in the out years there. And we can get you a number on that, Sandy. Thank you very much. And Dave, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I, I do know the answer to this, but those of us who were out at the celebration for the opening of the new, uh, the dirt for the Fort River School, <laughs> out, out of the, dirt. At the beginning um, saw some pretty terrific looking playground equipment, but my understanding is we, we can't, we don't have the ability to reuse that. It's in better condition than what's at Mill River. And it's certainly in better condition than what's at Wildwood. Um, there were two different playgrounds. So I don't know whether you've taken a close look at it, but the current the current plan is to just cart it away and give it away for parts rather than move it to another location in town. Um, was my yeah, understanding. I did glance at it the other day, Kathy, at the, uh, at the groundbreaking and I too kind of, wonder but often when you get into what what does that actually take how do you not damage it when you it it might be better to take a part and have the contractor you know there are many playgrounds i'm sure that are looking for parts that can no longer be used i also think you get into the insurance and the liability of something that's x number of years old and who's going to put it in and will they stand by it and i think most contractors won't stand by a as much as we'd like to it'd be the more sustainable thing to do i think if they're willing to take it off site and use it for parts in other playgrounds but to pick it up they're all in concrete you have to get the concrete out you have to reset it i i know paul and i have chatted about this briefly but it's it's challenging. So I, I and, and that's and we're many we're some years away from the Mill River uh playground. So Okay. That was just that was what we were also told by the school or designers mm -hmm. that we couldn't be and it was a liability, a warranty, and could we move it without damaging it? All of Yeah. I wish it was easier and I wish we could do it. It would be the sustainable right thing to do. But I think if they are willing to either use it in parts other places or uh, scrap it and then recycle it that way. So, What I'll do is I will definitely, uh, I'm, I'm gonna put the Mill River Playground into the, the late year uh, cycle here for my own notes. And we can talk about that. I can talk about that with finance and with you, Dave, certainly. Uh, uh, coming up in War Memorial, of course, there's a lot of moving parts there, but I can also I can also uh, add that to the long term. Okay. It, you know, thank you very much. And actually, I think that we've run through all of our projects for today. So um, Ray, Chris, Dave, and Stephanie, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Um, and thank you for the work you do every week, every day, and sometimes on weekends for the town. But um, you can all leave unless you want to sit for the next part of our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So Sandy, you sent us, or through Athena, you sent us a summary table and a um, debt service table, set of tables. Um, so we've got, my watch says, we're, we've, if we're trying to end at around six, we've got about 20 minutes left um, and there are no attendees, so there will be no public comments. I mean, I'll check that again, but I don't know what you would like to, do, how you would like to approach those, whether you want to, um, it, it, well, I'll start with, I think the total list for FY25 has changed a lot from what we <laughs> saw <laughs> with some very big items have moved off it. So if the summary table was still capturing those, um, we'll be helped a lot by those changes. So I don't, I don't know how much you want to talk off of either the debts, you know, either one. And I sent Sandy a few questions I had on this table because so, it particularly focusing on FY25, you know, on a, what's, what's on the list. So. So uh, right now uh, I've just pulled up the summary table with the changes that we heard today shows that we have about 
$1.2 million deficit in FY25, which was down from about a $2 million deficit. So we're moving in the right direction. We still have a $10 million deficit over the five years. And I, I got to think about this because um, I went back and looked at some old JCPC reports uh, for a number of issues, including what percentage of our um, capital spending was in debt versus what was in cash. Um, and I noticed from a long time ago that um, we would balance to the first year, but we wouldn't always balance for the five years. But that was from a while ago, and I don't know if it is the town's um, practice to try to have it balanced for all five years. So, um, Kathy, I don't know if you have an opinion well, about we, that. We got closer. to. I don't think we ever got all the way there. So last okay. year, if you look at last year and the year before, yep. there was uh, FY27 was always going to be a tough, one of them, a couple of them were tough years. Yeah. But we we weren't we weren't in the ten million dollars short range, okay. uh, you know. So one of the comments we made going into a few years ago, Sandy, was if it's a five year plan, and we've moved things from the current year to the next year, which means the next several years are all in deficit. We don't really have a plan. <laughs> Where the, the 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 plan the plan needs still needs a lot of work is the way I would <laughs> do yeah. it. You okay. know, so so it wasn't that we got to zero in each of the years, but well, we got to zero. So the projected so on the screen you've got FY twenty eight um, is is five million dollars in the hole. You know, and just so people know, the fire station's not on our ten year list at all currently. Um, and I was not quite sure how the Jones numbers matched up with um, the actual debt, the projected debt, because when I looked down the one column, it didn't it doesn't match some of the numbers we saw in November of last year, you know, pretty recent numbers. So I just wanted to make sure for the ones we haven't yet gone out to the bond market for this. The, um, so that was what I flagged. Um, on, you know, how how good are we on the, I'm just looking at FY25, but the actual debt at 2.9 and the projected debt at 50,000, that projected debt looked low to me if Jones is going to be borrowing in in this coming fiscal year. Um, okay. So it was just a question because when we saw it, Bob was on finance then, but and Anna was in the council, but when we saw it earlier, it was coming in in FY25 where it was something in the over a million dollar range. So it was a question on that rather than a... Um, so yeah. what, uh, for those, I looked at that, um, I have projected debt numbers, assuming a sale of, I think it's $15 million for Jones, this, May. So we will sell uh, bonds and have to start repaying them in FY25. I look back at the original sheet that you had from Paul that actually had some um, banning for another year instead of selling the debt this year, selling it a year from now. So that added a whole year of interest that what well, it's not in the projections that I've given you. So, um, and then the projections I have given you came from David Eisenthal, our financial advisor, um, that Sonia then put into a spreadsheet and then I copied. So um, I think they are more recent than the figures that you had from Paul in the fall. Okay. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yep. Okay. Um, so one more thing on the five years, the JCPC, what we focused on was getting to zero deficit in FY25. And we mm -hmm. noted we noted where we there was still a problem in the out years. So we didn't we didn't try to do all five years. We just sure. made 
comments on what what does the rest of the time look like. Um, but we were trying to get, with, with a lot of help from staff, where staff pulled something off or said we don't need to do it this year. So there are at least a few projects, I think, um, we heard, so I'll let you talk, but there were a few along the way that I thought there's another 800,000 or so that doesn't have to happen um, or mm -hmm. might not have to happen. Um, okay, so um, I'll talk about a couple of things. Um, I've just switched. Do you now see a chart on your screen? Yep. So right now, this is um, what our general fund debt service is projected out to be. This is how much we're paying. We're paying about two and a half million dollars of debt service interest and in principal on existing debt. And then this has a couple of new projects coming in, including assuming that DPW will start being having to be paid in 28. Um, usually when you look at future debt, well, usually what you see is a downward slope like this because you've sold all your debt and then you pay it off and it goes down over time. Uh, because we have increases for projected debt into the future, it is gonna go up and we're gonna have a fairly significant amount of debt in the future. Um, but uh, I just show you this because I do think this is something that I always look at a lot when I'm thinking about um, capital. In fact, usually what I do is I make it a little more sophisticated and I have existing debt and you see it going down and then I have the new debt added on top of it. I just haven't gotten that far. Um, but I do think as we're thinking about what we want to do into the future, um, you want to, you guys want to think about that and the new finance director wants to think about that. Um, I don't know there's much more to say about that than that. But um, the other thing is having said, oh, look at all this big debt that's coming into the future. I'm then going to say there are some big projects in the future, I think particularly in uh, 28, like this Crocker Farm that's listed as cash, but really, in fact, should be borrowing. Um, and so I, I also need to have some conversations with the school department about um, really is the planning for things around Crocker Farm because this stuff has shown up all of a sudden. And I think thinking about how to do it and when to do it needs to have further discussion. So I do think uh, there are a number of things I'm gonna look at in um, FY25 that I put as borrowing like the police public safety radio equipment. I'm looking at any other thing that might be in the three to 400,000 or more range, which I would be very used to borrowing in my other jobs. And uh, so I'm gonna look at that. I'm gonna look at borrowing for things in the out years. Uh, but I do think that there's also just gonna be some things that um, we're gonna have to go to departments and say they're going to have to make some choices. I'm going to say to police, all right, you've got these three projects. Which of these can we put out a year? I'm going to do the same thing with uh, some of these other departments because we can't do everything. And so I'm going to come back to you with, um, I hope, a more balanced plan with some recommendations. Um, that's basically where I am right now. Um, Again, it's a little bit inchoate, but um, you know, we're trying to make progress. Having said that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And um, actually, if you leave it up, I have a couple of questions. But Bob, go on. Yeah. Yeah. There was a there was a, a project from the fire department for 1.9 million for communications, and yes, we we're told that that might be possible to borrow to lease the equipment. Have you seen the numbers for leasing that equipment? Well, um, yes and no. I, I saw the email from Lindsay. I would say um, I very much doubt that a for-profit company can offer us better interest rates than we could get as a non-profit entity. And I, over the years, have looked at leasing 
number of times, and it always makes more sense to borrow. So that's okay. Uh, that's my take on that. Fair enough. I just wanted to just cross that T. <laughs> Excellent question. Eugene. I, I just wanted to ask a couple of uh, uh, super basic questions so I don't remain in potential ignorance. Um, I, I In my prior job, it was totally uh, corporate America. Um, so there was all this wonderful stuff that we could do with depreciation. <laughs> I... I, I <laughs> I just I just wanted to kind of understand from a from a a couple of things when we finance something like in this particular case let's say the Jones is that a a, a ten a twenty or a thirty year note? Um, is that the same for everything? If we finance a two hundred thousand um, dollar you know uh, a vehicle or something like that. So the general laws provide that you have to match the term of borrowing to the useful life of the um, thing that for which you're borrowing. Um, so for example, with these radios, I made a guess that these would last 10 years. I would have to verify that, but um, that was my guess. Uh, for uh, other kinds of equipment, um, you know, it might be five years, like if you were to borrow for computers, which we don't, but if you were, it, the maximum would be five years. For building projects, uh, currently you can you can borrow for as much as thirty years, and the legislature is considering a bill to change that to forty years. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, Amherst has borrowed for twenty years for its building projects until a few years ago, when the state allowed you to go up to thirty. So it's all all of which is to say it's all set by state law. It's specific by thing for which you're borrowing um and um and then you just plug that into your borrowing estimates so then what you see say for instance i'm borrowing a hundred thousand dollars for 10 years for the projected debt exclusion that number will show for the next 10 years at, at x dollar amount based on your excel formula is what you're saying yes, so and yeah okay i would just say there's if you if you really want to nerd out about this, then the other thing to consider is you can either borrow like a mortgage, in which case you pay equal principal and they just pay interest on the remaining amount. So your debt annual debt service goes down or you can borrow um, level funded so that you pay the same amount every year and the balance between interest and principal shifts. So you pay more interest up front more in, more principal at the end. Um, so I, I forget if I said, so that's like a mortgage. That, that's, that's the one that's like, example. yeah, right. Um, and so um, all of these projections so far, I think have been based on uh, for the smaller things that level principal, so declining payments for the, some of the um, big projects building projects, I think some of those are based on uh, equal payments over time. Um, because frankly, 30 years from now, if you're paying equal payments, it's not worth nearly as much. I mean, it's actually a good deal. Right, right, right. So so anyway, just, just to say that. And then just when you're looking at your projections, oh, I'm sorry, my last, because I, I just want to get my head around as we start looking at the spreadsheets and start getting down to brass tacks. You know, if I have a, you know, say again, the, the, the Jones Library Project, specifically because I'm a trustee, there's 15.8, but we'll be buying, we'll, we'll be issuing that debt as it's needed. It's not necessarily all going to be in one big lump sum. But do you sort of say to yourself, oh, there's this 10-year debt that's coming up. So for every $100,000 I borrow, is there like a back of napkin kind of thing where you say that's going to be X amount of dollars per year, just so we could start to kind of think about like that's, you know, as we start to juggle um, the actual per year <coughs> cost of any particular request. Am I making sense at all? So for excuse, every me, yes. excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. I just, I have to go to my ZBA meeting at six o'clock. Oh, I need okay. to leave. Okay. okay. Goodbye. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, every capital project has a cash flow. So, uh, you know, most projects, it's all done within a year. 
But um, for a big project, you know, like the uh, Port River School, that will be a multi-year project, and we will borrow in chunks. It okay. happens to be for Jones that we're borrowing the fifteen million all at once because of various cash flow issues with um, some of the other money that's coming in and when it comes in and the fact that we have to front some of that money uh, in order to get grants and so forth. Right. And because right. there's a certain amount of private fundraising that trustees have pledged to that is a big number in the out years. We don't have, the trustees don't have that money today or, or they're, they may have some of it, but in any case, right. we're borrowing all of the town money up front. Thank you. I'm glad you're the one doing this this spreadsheet and <laughs> trying to collect it. You know, this the idea of getting all these numbers into a spreadsheet that we're going to be able to make decisions on is mind boggling. So I truly appreciate the work you're doing. Thank wow. You. So, so I just wanted to make a few comments, Eugene, building on your excellent questions. You know, when when Sandy starts taking like the chiller replacement is 800,000 or the um, other for FY25, if we're borrowing that money, the number goes down to zero. <laughs> um, you know, we see the principal and interest on that in the coming year. So we'll see a distinctly different uh, total depending on whether he thinks that we're borrowing right at the beginning of the year and paying through half. So it 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 evens it out. Right. Um, but the one of the other two other big ones, we had a lot of questions about the um, sidewalk plow, the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar sidewalk plow. Sandy, on is this really necessary? And Guilford, when we pushed him on it, that's why I just want to look at another. When we pushed him on it, he said we could maybe make do with the, it's just not as good, their other equipment. So I had a question on the necessity of that sidewalk plow at 250. Um, and so I wanted to push on that. And the $450,000 for planning and surveying for the uh, North Amherst intersection up by, um, I think mm -hmm. is, is way too high and may be premature in that there's not, you can't start to do engineering studies unless you know what you're planning on doing. Yep. And just so people know that, that they have, a, the town has applied for a mass work grant three different times for this intersection with engineering studies. So it's not that they had no information that, and they have done two different traffic studies. So this should be, and then he talked about wetlands, but there are no wetlands where the rerouted road, there are wetlands, but they won't be affected. So I don't know, and I'm I'm worried if DPW gets that amount of money, they'll design something where there's not full buy-in on what needs to go in there. Um, right. And the roundabout down at Pomeroy there was a success in getting a mass works grant with a, we're either going to do this or we're going to do that. We didn't have to fully engineer it. So I'm not sure why. So it, it was a question. He said, well, maybe it could be a lot less, but the North Amherst community likes to get involved in these things. And there's actually been at least four charrettes, four meetings, a lot of consensus building. And Dave Zomick has been in those meetings and talked off a plan. So so I'm I'm just worried about that one. Um, and I was going to ask, I would suggest you ask Dave about it too. Um, you know, how far along are we to spend, allocate that amount of money? Um, so there have been two traffic studies and an engineering study. Um, so I'm just... It, it's so they were two big, fairly big ones that um, raised some questions. I know Sarah asked a lot about the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars sidewalk plow, um, and I think Bob did and a couple of people. So it was just a really. Um, so I there. So that was the only other large one, and I saw you already shifted the four hundred thousand records keeping system. They said we don't have to do it this year. You've already moved it into next year, so. Lee, I'll stop. I just, uh, no, uh, no, I was I just going to say thank you because you've answered some of my questions about planning and going forward. So thank you. 
Okay, so, th so those were my two. And then um, next week, just so if once Sandy gets us this revised with his recommendations on borrowing, which is borrowing, what, what does this look like for FY25? We, we do have to talk about what we just started to talk about, which of the projects do we have questions about um, in terms of reasonableness. And we do have the two resident proposals that aren't on this list at all to decide. And that that discussion will flow into what report we want to write. You know, so hopefully some of this is settled down enough that we're looking at a balanced or nearly balanced first year. And then we'll be talking about what happens to out years on it. But everyone should think of what other questions they might have had about the projects, because it will be just all of us talking about what what we want to say, because our report is to the town manager. You know, we're we're an advisory committee, um, but we're hopefully being helpful to get nearer to a balanced budget and make comments about the other five years. Um, so if I could just add a couple of things, uh, your comments about the sidewalk plow and the North Amherst uh, study were helpful to me. I would say if people have any other projects that they want to flag as, hey, what's up with that? Or I got a problem with it. You could either just speak up now or send me an email. My next step was to take all the projects in FY25 and put them in my own order of priority and, and see where the cutoff is in terms of how much money we have um, and try to um, get some feedback from some of the departments on that. So just to let you know, that's what I'm doing next. So that by next week, there's something a little more coherent for us to talk about. Hey, hey Sandy, can you send us the updated um, spreadsheet that you may have? So, cause mine is full of scribbles and numbers have changed and all that. It would be helpful to see something clean. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. You, you. you just, you know, we understand it'll just be a PDF, so we can't play with it. But that's I don't care. Okay. I just yeah, that's okay. It. So I think um, I just wanted to make one comment about minutes. You saw minutes was on the schedule. I, at the beginning, I said what we'd done in the past was whoever was the minute taker got me a draft. I reviewed it either with or without the Zoom. I take actually pretty good notes during these meetings. And then I do an edit and I can finalize it that way. If people would like to take time in the meeting to review minutes, it's fine with me. Sarah sent in minutes. I got them today and I did minor edits on them, really minor, a couple typos. Um, and I sent them to you all. But, but it's been time-saving for the meeting. So all the minutes up until today have been posted. They're posted under minutes rather than as drafts in our packets. So if anyone would like to revisit it and actually take time to review and vote on minutes, this was just me trying to expedite JCPC meetings because we tend to always use all the time allotted for the projects. Lee. I am deeply grateful to you for having created this very efficient and wonderful system, just my personal opinion. Okay, so so that will be the way since it, the awkwardness was when I was the minute taker, I can't easily review my own minutes, but <laughs> but as people who have been doing the minutes, when you get the Zoom, it's, it's, it's useful because you capture something and you can make sure you get it accurate. And we do have the Zoom and you can just say, you know, see the exhibits. You don't have to repeat everything. So we'll continue the practice and I'll post Sarah's minutes as finalized rather than as packet. So I, I think I think that's it for today. So is there a motion to to adjourn? We need to make this one. So anyone? moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second? All right. A quick vote. Bob. Aye. Kathy is a yes. Eugene. Yes. Lee. Yes. And Anna is Aye. a yes. Okay. It's unanimous. And thank you very much, Sandy. We are adjourned until thank next Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank guys. Thank you, everybody.